Thank you very much for introduction. Thank you for having us uh, on this session and uh, touching this so important topic of cybersecurity. Actually, uh, let me just share my uh, personal thought. I'm just wondering how many of you just thinking, okay, they, here they are again, cybersecurity experts. They will try to convince us how much we should uh, invest in cybersecurity. We're doing business. We heard this. Yes, that's, of course, very, very important. And now they, they will try trouble, troublemakers. So troublemakers of this panel, uh, of this panel discussion uh, are gentlemen uh, who were just introduced. But anyway, I would like to ask you to just uh, uh, share with our audience uh, which organization are you representing? And maybe a few words about your main areas of activity. So, Sławek, please start this short introduction. Okay, so, my name is Sławek Górniak. Uh, I work at Anisa. Uh, I've been working there for 15 years now and uh, in various areas. Uh, recently, I was involved in <coughs> certification, standardization, and somehow in electronic identification. Now I'm mainly in standardization, so I'm rather not a troublemaker. <laughs> Thank you. Can't think on this. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having me here. My name is Pavel Wolszka. I work with uh, Test Army, uh, Test Army Group. We're a cybersecurity consulting and quality assurance penetration testing company. I'm usually the person who deals with end product that incorporates security features, and I primarily deal at this moment with end user and business um, education in cybersecurity topics. Clemens? Yeah, thanks, Miroslav, uh, for the kind introduction. I'm Clemens, Clemens Vanko. I'm heading the accredited conformity assessment body um, at TÜV Austria, and I'm head and vice chair of the, um, the Council of the European uh, Conformity Ass Assessment Bodies, ACAPC. Um, I'm in the business um, and in the, the trust service um, area active since more than 25 years now. And um, we discussed that beforehand, Mir Miroslav and I. I like to make a statement before we start. Um, I found it very impressive to see this morning and especially the, this afternoon what, what's happening. So if, if, you, if you see where we came, came from, where came from, the industry came from a engineering driven um, an area where we had solutions, really good solutions in place for, for trustworthy communication, uh, signing, time stamping, and we were hunting for the business processes which, which would make use of these solutions. And the refreshing thing we saw this afternoon, specifically with the three business examples which were um, provided and shown, uh, was that that has turned completely, um, maybe uh, driven by the COVID-19 situation, um, that was boosted dramatically and it's really, really great to see um, how the industry has changed, how now the process makers are making use of trust services, implementing them in order to secure their operations and uh, to, to set up proper business processes. And that's something you all contributed uh, to, and therefore my congratulations. Hello, my name is Michał Kurek. Uh, I am head of cybersecurity in uh, KPMG, Poland and CE. Uh, so we try to help our clients uh, to increase security. So, uh, but sometimes when we do pen test uh, just scheduled just before release uh, official week, sometimes are troublemakers with our findings. I am also very uh, closely connected with uh, application security uh, community. I am a co-leader of uh, OASP Poland uh, chapter. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you to all of you for this uh, nice introduction. And I, uh, first of all, uh, again, a pers personal thought that f I'm so happy that the cybersecurity uh, became one of the main part of this conference. We have a special blog, yes? So that, that's, that's a promotion of the, of the topic which for, from, from uh, my knowledge, all of us uh, on this scene 
we are representing for, for many, many years now, and we are happy that we reached this maturity level, which allow us to, to make a next step, I would say. So, so actually, maybe it is nice to, to have a discussion about next steps and, uh, for example, to uh, propose the models of the referential models which we should follow, which we should uh, reflect to it. So, Clemens, the, the question to, to you, from your perspective, the role which of audits, uh, especially because audits are, are recognized of this, this activities which should answer the question where we are actually, how far we are from, from something, some model, some referential uh, model. So, from your perspective, I know you've, you've got so great experience uh, regarding audits, uh, and so from your perspective, the role of audits and the challenges, where are the challenges regarding this, this particular topic? Yeah, first of all, I, I believe the, the um, role of the audits is increasing. So what we see is a rising demand in, um, in questions of compliance. And what's desperately required are um, legal and normative requirement sets which are pretty clear for the industry as well as for the auditors um, to implement. And we have uh, Ricardo Gengini with us from Etsy Easy. He will be on the stage tomorrow talking about the standards. Um, I think that's a crucial point here to have the, that standards um, available and I know that Etsy is working hard to support um, what's coming up with the new IDAS regulation too. Um, and they are they are doing their best to support that with with technical standards. So if you ask for the for the challenges, um, from my point of view, the the challenge which is uh, is upcoming to us, uh, to the industry, to the auditors, is a dramatic um, raise in complexity. So um, we had a situation where we had the when we talk about the IDAS regulation, the IDAS regulation and a set of technical um, requirements uh, to be implemented and that it's going to be to multiply in the future. And therefore I see from the auditor's perspective that um, the, it, it may not be possible anymore for startups, for example, to, to just start with a good idea and get that successfully audited. So the, you, you may need um, a consultancy beforehand and you may need preparation. So things are becoming more complex. Uh, thank you. So, so if I may ask uh, Michal, the, the question you, because uh, Clemens gave us some, some big picture of the uh, audit, audit role, but then anyway, one day somebody is coming and say, but okay, but what actually we should do if we would like to, to recognize the situation, to have a good knowledge about what is going on. So which model, referentials model at the a little bit lower level, or more operational level you would recommend from, uh, from your experience to, to use for having the better understanding of the cyber security aspect of the, of the business? Yeah, I think uh, to uh, very well assess the whole security system, uh, it's quite a, a big challenge, like Clemens uh, um, uh, showed, um, especially that we need to uh, find the weakest points uh, in every system because this is actually the strength of the overall one. So not only we cannot uh, look at the uh, um, organization processes, uh, not only uh, look on the technology level, uh, but uh, um, look holistically. That's why uh, standards are very helpful, uh, just to allow us to uh, to not uh, to miss uh, some certain um, elements that are important. And uh, from my uh, um, experience, uh, a lot of risks uh, are in actual implementation. So even if we have uh, good uh, technical standards, um, nowadays the development processes uh, are Unfortunately, very rapid, uh, the uh, developers are rotating in the teams. Uh, there are sometimes uh, not enough communication uh, during development. Uh, also, there might be some assumptions. Maybe someone will not understand correctly the standards that they are implementing. And then there is a short path to critical vulnerabilities in the system. That's why, um, in my opinion, um, 
I don't, I don't want to say in general the most important area is technical security uh, assessments like penetration tests, those code reviews, but this is uh, nowadays where we have more and more complex technology, uh, this is something crucial and it cannot be um, like overlooked. And sometimes uh, just compliance uh, audit when, where you have three days to review um, documents and do some interviews is absolutely not enough enough to, to really uh, just uh, say something about the whole security system. I see Pavel wishing to, to comment, right? Actually, I can't agree more, more with my predecessor. I wanted to say that actually not only is it becoming more difficult in terms of the technical side, but also there's a managerial actual problem. Because a lot of decisions, for example, cloud migration or, for example, hybrid migration is actually dictated by certain managerial decisions in terms of, for example, uh, cutting costs, right? That is definitely something that's, that's, that's being done. And blanket statements or policy-based migrations usually end up being sort of certified at the lowest level in terms of can we get a certification, but that's security enough. And usually that's where the pitfalls of security come about is, is sort of pinpointing can we do checkpoint A, B, C, D. As long as we fulfill that, we're considering ourselves secure. secure. But that's just, just enough security, as I would put it. And uh, migration to any, any new platform, migration to the cloud, if that's done properly, that should be actually be a huge consultation between the actual use case scenario combined with managerial decisions in the IT department. So that's something that I would definitely point out that um, management decisions should be very deep consulted with the bottom end users at the end and with every single point of configuration rather than just being a policy driven approach. And uh, this is good. You use the magic words of done properly. Yeah, but what actually does it mean? Yeah, so, so how, how to know at the ma management level and what we provide to the management level to help management level, C level, to understand the cybersecurity and uh, what, they sh what should be their role, what tools they could, could use. I know Swavek, I, I know Anissa is absolutely, by the way, this is the, the high recommendation to use the Anissa library. Not re regardless of this particular topic, but, but any, any of the cybersecurity topics. But, but you have to have this big picture, right? Again, from, from the agency uh, perspective. And I know that your specialization is, as you said, as also the certi certification schemas. Is the place for this particular thing in, the, in, in, this, in this model to, to help the whole business to under, understand how to organize the cybersecurity? So basically, <clears throat> well, my fellow colleagues are uh, representing industry. Uh, I'm the only one from governmental, let's say, European side. Uh, so uh, I think a little bit differently <laughs> than you on this. Of course, uh, well, we are in, a, in the agency, we are in these specific positions, but uh, we are not, let's say, so much bound to speaking only with the member states and only with, uh, let's say, the council and uh, the commission that are the lawmakers, basically. Uh, but we can maintain the, the contacts with, with the industry, so it results in these studies, in these recommendations, guidelines that we're issuing, uh, having in mind to be as conclusive and as inclusive as possible, meaning that we are talking with the industry and we are gathering, um, uh, well, knowledge from them. When it comes to, um, well, standards that were mentioned earlier, <clears throat> It's true that standards alone, let's say, will not uh, uh, well, allow for cybersecurity fully. They have to be implemented correctly. And also, it's true that even the best certifications, uh, well, the best uh, assessments, let's say, leading to certification uh, can leave some, some room, let's say, for improvement. And also, this depends on the laboratory who is uh, performing the, um, uh, the, the audit. Um, how properly they do it, and uh, well, many other factors uh, concluding to this. Still, certification is something that, uh, let's say, states that at this very moment, this laboratory <coughs> considered um, a certain process, product, um, or as secure, or service as secure. Uh, as secure according to a specific scale. So um, now, for a couple of years, when uh, cybersecurity, so-called Cybersecurity Act is, is in place, um, these, well, the European institutions try to harmonize the, <coughs> uh, well, the, 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 the way of proceeding at European level, meaning that uh, we try, let's say, by 
introducing this uh, um, this framework to unify somehow the uh, the way of proceeding and uh, not to allow too many deviations left and right. And uh, well, we are still at the very beginning of this process because well, ANISA is receiving requests for um, drafting uh, certification schemes from the European Commission. Till now, we received only three, and basically they are still on the elaboration. So this is a scheme on common criteria that is the successor of, uh, uh, of the previous uh, <coughs> uh, national initiatives. Uh, we have a, a scheme for, for cloud services, which is also kind of horizontal, and then now we started with uh, the 5G scheme. So basically these schemes are, uh, well, like, like we see this, the, the, these schemes, first we are working on so-called so horizontal schemes, so covering many aspects from, uh, of cybersecurity, let's say the generic ones, uh, while afterwards we hope to have uh, some particular schemes, vertical ones, like for example, well, for the new EIDAS uh, 2, there is a possibility that we get a request to elaborate uh, something in this regard. Yeah, okay, if you, just one short additional question to this, because it, it is complex, yeah, it, it is complex, but if you could give us some, some uh, opinion on the, on the timeline of, of, of these next steps, in the, when we could expect this horizontal or full, uh, full vertical uh, approach ready, yeah? so, so what, how long we, should, we are going to wait for it, right? Uh. I would like to respond that, unfortunately, my <coughs> crystal ball is uh, in service. <laughs> but uh, the truth is that uh, we don't know, because basically <coughs> with some... So, so um, how, mu how much it is on the, on the agency side, how much is on the member state side? So the process of uh, elaborating such a scheme is very complex. So first, ANISA has to take on board, let's say, uh, the request, and uh, basically we are setting up some requirements for the scheme. Then we are gathering uh, groups of experts that are helping us in this, and then we have actually three main groups that help in each of the schemes. So it's a so-called ad hoc working group that we are creating ourselves that usually count around 50 um, specialists in the field, let's say, um, from, from various organizations. We have standardization bodies there, we have industry, um, and uh, well, these are the people that basically write the scheme together with us. Then on top of this, we are in full contact, meaning that under control of uh, the U European member states, grouped in so-called ECCG, European Cybersecurity Certification Group. And uh, there is also a third body that is called SCCG, so this is stakeholders group, um, also uh, issued from industry, but they are like more permanent ones than the ones uh, in, uh, in ad hoc working groups. So when it comes to the timeline of elaborating such a scheme, um, it depends a lot on the subject. So it's true that, well, some member states, for example, have different view on certain areas, on cybersecurity of certain areas than the others. I don't want to, like, elaborate uh, in, into details, but, uh, well, <clears throat> some, some countries are, let's say, more inclusive, more closed in their uh, mind of perceiving cybersecurity. Others are more open. So this is like in the past we had, so, well, discussions on closed systems and open systems. Uh, what is more secure. Uh, uh, the, okay, so for sure we already know that it is complex. And you, Clemens, you mentioned this first time, so I will have a, uh, another uh, question to you. But uh, let me first uh, ask, ask Pavel about... So let's, for some relief, come back to the more operational level and maybe we could ask... Uh, we had a good, nice discussion before the panel and you mentioned nice uh, experience uh, from your work about the, the, how the behavioral anomalies, observations, or user interface things could improve cybersecurity of the, of, the, of the solution. So let's come back for, not maybe come back, let's touch at, at least a little bit this, this practical thing and we'll come back to the complex because we cannot avoid it. Okay, well, um, if we're looking at a product, and that's primarily what, uh, as a company, and I personally work on, 
if we're looking at a product, so there's various ways of securing it. One of, the, one of the ways, of course, is getting the appropriate certifications, going through an audits, so, you know, having the appropriate, um, I would say, documents and, and processes in terms of even the way the documents um, are running around your system. But that's, that's just one part of it. One of the things that's consistently noticed is that there is two versions of security. There's the defensive security and there is the offensive security. And uh, if we're looking at, for example, defensive security, looking at monitoring, for example, monitoring of behavior, there's traditional monitoring usually, which is basically shortening the reaction time, and there is also mm, the proactive monitoring, which can be behavioral analytics. Uh, so um, with certain certification, certifications, for example, in the United States, they actually do require you to have, HIPAA is one of them, some type of uh, analytics to be actually gathering information of how, this, um, how the user is behaving with the data that he or she has, right? So if we're looking at UEBA, which is uh, User and Entity Behavior Analytics, um, that is a solution that actually can predict uh, certain things and actually preemptively make choices for us through machine learning. So that is a certain aspect that is actually going above and beyond just the certification, but actually making sure that your final product is going to stay secure. And that actually raises a whole lot of is issues and questions. At which point this product security is still our contractual obligation, and at which moment we can actually say, well, that's, that's just a user's fault at the end, right? Because there's the, there's the whole, um, whole uh, wide perspective in terms of, US and, uh, of UX and UI design, which we need to consider. For example, uniformity in terms of, in terms of security and how we're conveying information. And right now with this uh, new regulation version 2.0 with, with the European Digital Wallet, right? well, that's still being debated on how we're going to convey information about security of the site in a very clear and concise manner across all browsers and across all uh, in interfaces. And that's something that's still to be decided. We're yet to see that. So we need to think about it in terms of our product, of how our product will actually lead the user towards having the, the comfort of using it, knowing where they're headed, and actually maybe even implement certain features in terms of interface that will actually help them, enable them, and I don't want to use the word force, but encourage them to actually make the right decision in terms of the product. Um, I'll just give you a, a case in point example. Uh, if we're looking at, at, use, if, at conscious security design of UI, um, let's take a look at a banking application, which uh, it forces you to type in your PIN number every time you, appro you approve an application, but the keyboard that provides you is not a standard Android keyboard. It's a built-in keyboard through this application that's specifically designed so we know that's actually compliant and that's not a third party. On top of that, even if you try to, for example, take a photo of me typing in the PIN number, well, that PIN number actually changes the one, two, three numbers, digits, actually change their location. So even recording that, uh, is difficult to actually guess my PIN number. So it's things, it's, it's cues like that, it's breadcrumbs, it's actually explaining to your users what is in their best interest might actually be in our interest. Because there's a problem with overall security in terms of who do we blame, right? When there is a security leak, when there is a security breach, it's easy to sort of scoff it off and say, well, we are certified, therefore, up to a certain moment, everything was great. If anything doesn't work, that's the user. And that used to be the policy. That used to be the policy probably about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, just, just more of an um, interesting piece of information if we look at even the policy of Microsoft Windows, right? We could, you used to be able to just simply ignore updates. That was the thing. If, if, if Windows didn't bother you with updates, you just kill it, then you say close the browser, close the Windows, and we're done. What, what, what ended up happening is, is um, most of people didn't install updates. So actually Microsoft had bad PR because of that, because everybody said, well, look at Windows. It's, it's full of security calls. Well, Windows is actually a really good product. There's nothing inherently insecure about it. The problem was is that, that people were choosing the less secure method. So we're approaching security, it's actually better how to think in terms of your product, in terms of what can you do to actually lead your user to work, to utilize the, the end product in a way that's very convenient and that's the preferred way. Because regardless of what you do in terms of educating the user, hey, you should update, hey, you should use two-factor authentication, maybe you should use more efficient ways of doing things. The ergonomics, the user friendliness is going to win. And that's something that's very often admitted in terms of final end product design, regardless of what, uh, what it is in the end, of how secure um, elements of the final solution are. The end result is we have to take care of the weakest link. And I think one of my predecessors mentioned that there is a stereotypical situation. Human beings are the weakest link, and we all know that. So what do we do about it? Okay, but 
one more additional, again, additional question, because I'm just wondering how much that, because we are probably convinced in this, in this group that that's a nice idea, yeah? that this kind of monitoring, this kind of solutions, like flying pin, but whatever, right? To, 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 uh, to have this, this dynamic factor which improves with strength and cybersecurity. But is it still the idea, your observation, it is much, is the market mature and these kind of projects are already introduced and we can see the difference in, in cybersecurity level of solutions uh, enriched with such functions, with such uh, solutions? Well, it's not cybersecurity products as much as I'm talking about the final product when you're designing your own product that encompasses yeah, but, but certain this is transactions. Functions, so let's let, hopefully, let's agree on this is cybersecurity related functions, yeah? Yes. So, so. But for, but for example, let's just take an, take an example of, of a website that features any type of transaction, correct? Uh, majority of the sites today utilize some type of analytics software that just basically tells you what's the browser, what the operating system, what's the environment of the end user actually utilizing your, your, your solution, right? So you can actually utilize that to your advantage. We all know that, for example, and this is anecdotal anecdotal information at this moment, we all know that you shouldn't use outdated browsers, right? But how do you actually make the user realize that it's in their best interest to actually not use that solution with your product? Well, you can just tell them you can't enter, right? Well, that's just going to lose your customer. You can tell them, uh, well, you are, you're, being, you're not doing something right, right? Well, that's just, that's just annoying them. However, I'm just throwing out an idea out there. What if you, just, you looked up CVE codes? for, for example, the browser you're accessing the website with, and you have a nice little nudge of information that says, do you know that your version of the system actually has X amount of uh, vulnerabilities? That's our CVE codes, basically. We can count them. We can make an algorithm that actually displays them. So you're actually vulnerable to X amount of exploits. It's in your best interest to update. Here, update and come back, please. Th those are the so visual cues that I want to talk about. If you could display about. together with this information how much money will cost you if you will not implement them, that would, I say... Well, that, realize, you are vulnerable, right? And we're doing everything in our power to make this better. However, there is a certain amount that you need, yeah, to, you need to play I, in. I'm mentioning this because in, from my observation, what we are missing, and this is absolutely very difficult, I have no doubts that we, we cannot, in cybersecurity world, experts we, who convince themselves, but only themselves in most cases, that it is so important, we, we cannot... We, we, we cannot speak in, in very business-oriented language. Maybe that, that was my, my, my uh, example, maybe very extreme of displaying the amount of money you, you will probably lose if you don't implement this, uh, these patches, right? Well, it's, it's, it's difficult to even say amount of money, but the fact that you're putting so, yourself this is all willingly about money. at risk. Let's <laughs> well, it is about yeah. money, but you can, you're putting, you, you can word it nicer, you know, because if, yeah. you're, if you're scaring somebody, that's also there's a psychological aspect of that, right? But if, you're, if you can actually let them know let them know that what you're doing is risky. You shouldn't feel comfortable about it. Well, that's, that could be enough because regardless of what you provide, cybersecurity uh, training services, even if you pay for the top level uh, professors to come over and educate your user base for free, chances are nobody's going to use it. That's that's unfortunate part of it. Yeah, we don't have the time. This is, this is interesting Can question we? about who should be interested in paying for cybersecurity, but this is another topic and I promise Clemens to, to come back because you said rising complexity of uh, uh, all, all this stuff, right? So, so give us the examples. Give us the examples. Let's prove it. Uh, I shall be happy to, to provide an example. Um, can I quickly respond yeah, to what, what yes, Pablo has just, just said? So I, I think from the independent auditor's perspective, um, uh, there's nothing to be said against that. So we need more awareness in the on the management level. Um, and... Um, we need the um, a user which is driven through a secure process and that we need to have closed barriers around that secure process so that the user stays within the secure process and, and does not uh, escape for sake of security, for sake of um, our, our business purposes. And of course, it's a challenge to reach to that level. I, I completely agree. So we as auditors, we are asking ourselves exactly that question. How can we react to an industry where um, 
the, the formerly rather static processes are now turning since last five to ten years into a really, really dramatic um, dynamic world. And um, the dynamic is a big issue for um, a standardized process because as exactly as you said, um, um, the auditor used to look at a process um, from a static point of view and then he said, okay, I've seen that process and if you operate the process exactly that way, then that's conformant and you, you are um, operating it under our seal. Uh, and that's not... Um, that not, that's not the truth anymore. That doesn't fit to the industry, which um, has a highly dynamic uh, process and, and, and has changed. So what, what we do to react and, and respond to that is we, we cannot stop looking at the pure process. We also need to look at the management process behind. So we need to look at how the organization is ensuring over time that specific quality quality assurance, security um, requirements and the corresponding security in the level is um, remain stable at the level we, we need it to be. Um, and that's actually the, the, the clue and the solution where we are migrating to. That's to, to respond to you. Um, can I have another minute and I'm, I'm coming to the complexity thing? Yes, um, yeah, let me grab an example, the IDAS regulation as we have it um, today. If, if you look at the IDAS regulation, it's from 2014, started being implemented 2016, and um, if a trust service provider would want to provide, let's say, a qualified uh, trust service under this IDAS regulation, then they would up, set up their process and they would receive a corresponding um, conformity assessment and a report, hand that into the supervisory body, and they finally... Um, on success would be put on the EU trust list um, representing uh, that trust service as a qualified service. If we now look ahead to what is um, coming at the horizon with um, IDAS 2, then the situation is a bit different. Obviously, um, it's necessary to look at additional uh, security aspects like cybersecurity. Um, critical infrastructure uh, related security questions um, and um, data privacy. And that had been integrated so far in the existing IDAS regulation we have and is now taken out. Uh, obviously, that's the idea, so we don't have the final release of the IDAS 2, but that's the idea to take that aspects out and refer to other additional legal requirement sets which then are underlaid by technical normative requirements and need to be fulfilled by service providers in addition. So what we see upcoming are um, a, a variety of additional um, audits and certifications uh, service providers may need to undergo in the future. And I don't Oh, unfortunately, I cannot stop here because what, what comes on top is that from the legal perspective, um, especially one, the, the NIST 2 um, on uh, cybersecurity is um, a legal uh, construct which is um, that a so-called directive and the directive needs to be put in place and implemented by the different 27 European member states. And if you think about an implementation of a, of a directive in 27 member states, then you, you easily come to the idea that they may implement it differently. So that means, again, if you are a service provider active all over Europe, you may um, focus 27 member states with 27 different requirement sets. They may overlap for sure, but still you may um, be required to provide um, conformity assessments, certifications in more than one member state. That comes on top and that raises the level of complexity. Yeah. <laughs> No, because, uh, Clemens, uh, when we speak about well, the implementation of NIS directive, uh, I can assure you that even the current one is quite precise when it comes to requirements, security requirements. It's just that, well, in different member states, there are different, uh, let's say, usage is different. 
and other entities, for example, are uh, in the bucket of uh, essential services. And uh, this differ differs from one country to another, and basically obliging all the member states now to uh, adopt the same approach towards uh, even... Well, also, some of the aspects fall under national security, yep. which actually cannot be the subject of European regu uh, regulation, because this is, uh, this is purely to, to each member state to define this. So, uh, well, NIS directive, even number two, uh, would have big difficulties of being implemented as a regulation, of being voted as, uh, well, as being um, passed by as, as a regulation. Also, as you well well mentioned, now the legal acts that uh, speak about cybersecurity actually start really making a, a, an ecosystem. So, <clears throat> as well, I said in the previous panel that um, we didn't have anything that was mentioning cybersecurity in the past, then we started um, legal acts popping here and there, and now they really form a, um, a kind of cloud and that, that is consistent. So now in EIDAS 2, certain requirements, for example, <clears throat> from the EIDAS, so in EIDAS 2, the requirement, for example, for um, notifications will be probably passed to NIS, and uh, the, the provider TSPs will be put on the, <clears throat> on the, on the, in the list of digital providers. But still, um, European institutions are working now on, let's say, harmonizing this approach. And um, even though it's a regulation, NIS will be still under directive, uh, I don't think that uh, there will be a problem with re security requirements there. Only with the perseverance of certain areas, let's say. Um, quick response to, to close that up from my perspective. I, um, I really appreciate, or I think we, the auditor, can say um, we really appreciate that ENISA became active in that and, and takes the role of um, a coordinator. I think that's really important. The point um, I wanted to make is that we're and obviously we receive um, um, also feelings from the industry, we see the danger that that falls apart and that the effort um, for additional certifications um, is, is rising. I mean, we're earning money with this, so it will be for us a, a pleasure. Um, but um, if then um, companies say, okay, it's not a business case for us anymore, then we overdo it. And that's the danger we see, and that's why I think we should discuss it. And as I said, uh, we are really grateful that, that Inisa has taken that, that role coordinating now. And um, yeah, let's just see. One small remark only. And, that, and uh, then Michal, because <laughs> it's... Yeah, I'm sorry, just, just one small remark. We are not really coordinating this. We are just fulfill, I mean, filling the niches that are left by the legislators on one hand and uh, the industry from the other. I would like to add to the uh, current discussion one very important aspect of cybersecurity management. It is connected with this uh, pop up uh, window telling about money. Uh, and uh, like Mirek, you uh, mentioned, that we should be able to speak on business uh, language with, with management. And um, talking about regulations, touching this point, uh, I personally like, because I think it's a good di direction that more and more um, risk analysis, risk assessment is a core element of, uh, of today's regulations like GDPR, etc. And, um, but in order to do proper risk, an risk analysis, um, one very important aspect is that we should uh, create a culture and uh, to good discussion between cybersecurity specialists who understand what are the threats, what are the risks, and uh, also um, business uh, management who knows the value of processes, money, uh, of uh, assets that are uh, uh, needed to be protected. And only by combining those two uh, views, we can do proper risk assessment. Uh, and I think, uh, like uh, even historically, we, uh, say, we, we could say uh, that it's... Um, uh, IT security. Uh, now, it's, when we are thinking about cyber security, we should uh, think about uh, that this is a business issue, in fact. And uh, cyber security specialists sh should be like consultants helping to uh, do proper decisions by business, not the other way. Um, 
because uh, if it's other way, if uh, security uh, teams are strong, they will block business to go um, um, to, to new technologies, etc. And uh, other way around, if uh, you know that the, the communication is weak and uh, business is uh, just making decisions, then um, just uh, going without understanding responsibilities of using new technologies very well can uh, open pitfalls that can be uh, very dangerous. I'll just add a very obvious statement because I once again, I, it's difficult to disagree with my predecessors, really. I'm just going to add one obvious statement is that is we, we need to realize that in the end, uh, if, if a security breach happens, um, the PR result, negative PR we're going to get, that is satisfied customers, whatever it may be, and the actual fines, potential fines or um, negative aspects of that is actually a business expense. It's not an IT department that's going to, to, to feel the hurt, it's actually the business owner. Yeah, um, by the way, if there are any questions from the audience uh, in English or Polish, please raise your hand and we can uh, actually add these questions to our discussion. Uh, but there is only 10 minutes left and I'm just wondering and a little bit uh, afraid that we will leave our audience with this feeling of complexity and uh, no clue solution yeah what to what to do so so maybe just to remind all of us what is the debate then of of today's discussion which is uh, system identity process data and information so which of these factors which they all should be enriched with the cyber security factor again yeah there are the most important from, from your perspective, which could be the game changer, actually, yeah? Uh, some people say something, I, I, I wanted to say something, but don't want to influence your, your answer, but I, I'm interested in your opinion. So, anyone who... So, uh, I think when, when we are talking about system and... Please don't uh, answer all. Yeah, we don't accept this. Let's, let's try to make, prioritize them. <laughs> Okay, um, for me, definitely security should be um, very, one of the very first ideas when we are thinking about new system, new product, uh, whatever. Uh, if we don't uh, follow security by design principle, then uh, the... Um, uh, fixing of, uh, of, of problems that we identify at later stage is uh, much, much more expensive than if we would think at the start properly. So for me, this is the most important. And the second, the, can I do the second thing? It's already... Yeah, are, again, system identity, process, data, and information. They are maybe not from the same group. That's yeah. another puzzle. But... but Let's, from our experiences here, let's give the hand, right, to the audience. Okay. So, what do, do you think which you should prioritize as the first, the most important, if there are some you know, priorities should be built in the organization? Uh, that there is no uh, people there. Or if there is so some, some lack identity. of something, you, 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 <laughs> it's your mind. Identity is also uh, extremely important today to properly manage uh, identities. And uh, let's take even... Uh, uh, cloud security. We mentioned about responsibilities uh, that uh, uh, like question, is cloud uh, secure? And uh, there are different opinions. In uh, one of uh, KPMG surveys, I've seen even opinion in Poland uh, that uh, more, uh, more Polish organization thinks that it's uh, safer to keep uh, your data on-prem rather than in cloud. Uh, so that's very uh, strange, I mean, uh, because uh, especially for small, medium uh, enterprises, uh, it's uh, almost impossible to, to, to get to the level of security that you can achieve in, uh, in uh, public cloud. Nevertheless, when we see it, breaches, many breaches comes from cloud, so uh, maybe people think, okay, it's uh, not very secure. but. All, I don't know uh, any breach that will not be a, a mistake of, 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 of people uh, who don't understand what are their uh, responsibilities in keeping the, the cloud secure. That's why I think uh, people are the most important uh, aspect to, to work on in, in order to increase security. Uh, I miss people here, that's why... <laughs> 
Okay, let, let me catch the ball. Um, I think identity. I would go for identity um, because if you let's grab a trust service um, as an example without. Um, the, a high level of assurance in the identity of a person, the following trust service, does not make any sense. So we need to be very, very clear and we need to have a very high assurance level when it comes to identification, the person's identity, and I see um, with the upcoming um, um, identity wallet um, under the IDAS regulation too, that's really a great thing and I see really great developments when it comes to um, identity proofing, where we migrate into a world we're making use of deep learning algorithms and, and artificial intelligence to identify a natural person. Um, that's really, really great and, and very great to be a part of that, that industry. So that's... Yeah, our, our Swavik, probably your favorite ones. So for me, honestly speaking, they all belong to the same bucket. And, uh, belong or don't belong? Belong to belong. the same bucket. So this is, these are like... I disagree, but let's uh, go on. What's <laughs> in, well, as an answer to, to like, the, the subject of our discussion, I would say that, well, um, from my perspective as working for a European institution, important is to create such law that will actually take into account the needs and the possibilities of the industry, and then industry to adapt to these laws easily. And that's... Uh, well, basically the inscription on the, on the bucket is important things, I agree. But if uh, another inscription, I don't, cannot, cannot uh, actually think of which one, but identity from my perspective is more like a, f some another f factor or function yeah, which we get provide to the, to the, for example, to the data or information, right? But, but anyway, yeah, but it seems like identity, it's our favorite one. Pavel, do you agree or? Uh, I'm going to say something very abstract. I'm going to say actually ergonomics. There's tons of solutions and tons of processes which actually are great. There have been countless amounts of excellent tech So complex that is came the out. enemy, right? Um, well, the issue is that is, is sometimes even less secure solutions actually end up winning the market. And uh, we can have the best tech, we can have the best processes, we can have the best backend, backend systems managing all of that. However, if that is actually not, uh, not user-centric, that will never become the de facto standard. So that's something that I usually worry about whenever I hear about standards. Um, I come from the US mostly, um, that's where I grew up, and so there's a little bit different mentality, but if you notice the European mentality versus the United States mentality, there is a big difference. Europe is very procedural, we come up with procedures, we actually audit them, we verify them, and that's how it works. But is that actually producing something that we'll actually use? Will the implementation of it go well, and will, will it become the de facto standard? Well, that is a question that I'm very personally concerned with. So actually achieving a secure standard that is actually by choice of the end user. So that's the reason why I'm saying something very abstract, ergonomics. This is interesting opinion because maybe we just uh, define the, the, the factor which is the both, I mean, both words, the business word and cybersecurity expert, as we hear now, considered to be so important, right? like user experience, user interface. This is actually the, something which is discussed in the business rooms, yeah? how, how, to, how to propose the service the, to, the, to the customers. And at, at the same point, at the same point, at the same situation, we also can propose cyber secu security, right, to the, to the, to the user, uh, to the serv serv uh, together with the service. So maybe we just identified it, this thing Identify, yeah, identi yeah. <laughs> identify this thing which could uh, make our, our common work more uh, worse, right? Do, do you agree? Yeah? Or is, uh, and other things which could be made easily uh, to, to, to uh, work together, actually regarding the, the some standardizations or... It must be balance everywhere, so cybersecurity yeah. cannot be first. Uh, and if we take business first, then usually cybersecurity also, if the business is aware of the cyber threats, it's also uh, on top. But uh, still, it is a business decision, and uh, I agree that it's, it must be balanced. Yeah, I can only support that. Uh, yeah, we need to have the full set. Just having a look at this. 
uh, room. Are there any questions to our panelists? So, if not, just one, just one statement here. Like, I mean, if we see these entities, I mean, these words here on the, on the on the screen, basically, one cannot live with another. It's like discussing what is more important. Uh, confidentiality, availability, or integrity. Yeah, this is the roots, well, right? So like this, so this is the absolute fun fundament of our, of our our work, which is always staying stable and uh, and the same. So we should also keep in mind the, the basic model. Uh, so, if not, thank you very much for these nice opinions and this uh, nice discussion to our panel panelists. Let's thank thank them with the claps of hands. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting us. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.